Canada curious? This is the Yes We Canada podcast, the progressive's guide to getting the fuck out. This episode, in Canada, crime pays in Canadian. Hi, I'm Matt Zimbel. When you look at the real estate listings in New York City, you can find a crime profile of the neighborhood. It's like a Google map, and, and when you click on the crime icon, the areas in the hood that have criminal activity turn orange. It's like the opposite of the local amenities listing. So instead of three pharmacies, a dry cleaner, and a pet shop, you get two drunken disorderlies, three B&Es, and a domestic. Since you're moving to Canada, the Yes We Canada podcast is delighted to offer you the crime profile of your neighborhood, downtown Canada. I know a few people who have done time in the slammer. Not bragging, just stating. One of them was an international media mogul. You know, private jets, mansion in New York, mansion in Florida, London, Toronto, a master of the universe. Until, well, until he wasn't a master anymore and he became what he so eloquently described as a guest of the American people. I'm sure we can agree that calling an American federal medium security penitentiary a guest house is the delightful spin of the aristocracy. My ex-mogul buddy told me that the word in the big house is that these days all the crime is taking place on the internet. We have the internet in Canada, you've been forewarned, and we have crime in Canada in every variety. Violent crime, hate crime, drug crime, sex crime. We even had white collar crime here. But that's been legalized recently because too many of our titans of industry were going to jail. We have as many criminals and sickos per capita as you do in the U.S. But our sickos are on a budget because I'm sure you've long heard the expression, crime doesn't pay. And up here in Canada, crime pays in Canadian which is why Canadian thugs have smaller budgets than your thugs and have less access to semi-automatic weapons, which are restricted here. Just like in the U.S., gun control in Canada is a thorny subject, one that falls pretty much along the classic rural-urban, right-wing, left-wing lines. The biggest difference is that in Canada, our lawmakers are not full-time employees of the National Rifle Association. Handguns are also a restricted and prohibited weapon in Canada. This means to carry a handgun, you need to get a permit from the RCMP. And for your Canadian citizenship test, what does RCMP stand for? I'm going to give you a hint. Dudley Do-Right, Always Gets His Man, Musical Ride. That's three hints. Any of that ring a bell? Come on. You can do this. Did you say Canadian Mounted Police? Come on down. If you want a prohibited or restricted weapon in Canada, you need permission from the RCMP, and it is rarely granted. To qualify, your life has to be under threat. Ordinary police protection has to be deemed insufficient. Now, this will come as no surprise to you, but the RCMP rarely think of themselves as insufficient. You may be able to get a permit if you require a handgun for work, meaning that you're handling dangerous goods or, or handling wildlife. And technically, if you're handling wildlife, you should just stop that and go home because you're an American pervert. Besides, shooting a bear with a handgun? Eh, doesn't work. Jeez, that tickles, eh? <laughs> Gun crimes in Canada are much less prevalent than in the U.S., but they do exist. We bought an old industrial loft in downtown Montreal, and the day the sale closed, we rushed from the lawyer's office, keys and sweaty palms, to reinspect the dump now as owners. When we excitedly turned onto our new street in our brand new neighborhood for the very first time, we were stopped by a gigantic police barricade. Cop cars everywhere, a command unit, ambulances, fire trucks, police radios crackling to the left of us, megaphones barking to the right of us. What's going on here? We asked the police. A uh, hostage taking, armed. Is there any other kind? It all ended well, no one got hurt. Turns out the loft is a lovely, peaceful, quiet place to live, pretty much free of crime. In 2020 in the United States, you had 615 mass shootings which was 181 more 
than in the year before. We only had one mass shooting, but it was the worst in our history. When a white male, a dental technician, went on a homicidal rampage for over 14 hours in Nova Scotia while dressed as a cop, driving a car decked out as a replica of an RCMP cruiser. He killed 22 Nova Scotians. This was an exceptionally rare crime. Nova Scotia is on the east coast of Canada and is the home to some of the kindest, warmest, most peaceful people you would ever meet anywhere. In fact, you might want to live there when you decide to move to Canada. After your immigration status is approved and you cross the border into Canada sporting your best weekend warrior duds and driving your army surplus tank with Confederate plates with your cache of military-style assault weapons safely stowed, you're going to love it here. Welcome, bienvenue au Canada. Anything to declare? Yeah, my Second Amendment rights, tally-ho, dude! Don't start screaming at the customs officer about your Second Amendment rights. Because in Canada, while you do indeed have Second Amendment rights, they refer solely to the terms and conditions of entry into the Canadian Federation by the province of British Columbia in 1871. Nice tank, though. You're packing for Canada, and I'm yapping on about packing in Canada. Now, this might be hard for you to wrap your head around, but up here, you do not have the right to bear arms or to form a militia. You do not have the right to open carry. Mom, be honest. Does my Glock and holster make me look fat? No, honey, it makes you look like a patriot. Sweetie, the jeans make you look fat. <gasps> Mom! The only thing you have the right to open carry in Canada is your groceries. And even open carry groceries have a few legal limitations. The Canadian Supreme Court recently released a decision restricting the rights of Canadians to cross provincial borders with beer purchased in another province. We take our beer very seriously up here. I mean, your mom and apple pie is our Pamela Anderson and beer. <sighs> and remember for the citizenship test, we don't have states, we have provinces. We also have free Medicare for life, so actually studying a little bit for your citizenship test is not a complete waste of your very important American time. Oh, you are just the cutest little xenophobe, you. <laughs> While we're talking about open carry, we do have to address the elephant in the room. And before you get any ideas, put your hunting rifle down. That elephant in the room is a protected species. It, this really pains me to tell you this. But the National Rifle Association, yep, our fault. Blame Canada. You see, the executive vice president of the NRA is a guy by the name of Wayne Lapierre Jr. Turns out the Lapierre family descends from the Daughters of the King. Now, you may remember that because we spoke about them on last week's podcast, How to French in Canada. Wayne's people came to the New France, later known as Quebec, Canada, in the 1600s from Normandy. And we all know how popular automatic military assault weapons were in Normandy in the 1600s. So, though I lack any kind of legit royal authority, I would like to officially and posthumously apologize to the people of the United States on behalf of King Louis XIV of France, who four centuries ago shipped an innocent young orphan girl from Normandy over to the buggy colonies eventually begatting those who begat and who begat again until Wayne Robert LaPierre Jr. was begat in Schenectady, New York in 1949. And Wayne, you have some splaining to do. On December 14, 2012, at 9.35 in the morning, a deranged 20-year-old white male, outfitted in combat clothing, entered the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut and murdered 26 innocent people. Twenty of his victims were little children. His weapon of choice was his mother's Bushmaster AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle. While doing the research for this podcast, I came across a minute-by-minute -minute timeline of the mass shooting. A six-year-old girl survived by playing dead in the washroom. When she was eventually evacuated, she called her mother and said, Mommy, I'm okay, but all my friends are dead. And that's when I could read no longer. The Bushmaster AR-15 is a gun that is affectionately known as America's Rifle. 
It is capable of shooting roughly one round per second, and the gun has a magazine that contains from 30 to 100 bullets. There are more than 15 million AR-15s owned by private citizens in the United States. And a few days after the Sandy Hook Elementary School mass murder, Executive Vice President of the National Rifle Association, Wayne LaPierre, gave a speech in Washington where he blamed the media for calling semi-automatic military assault weapons machine guns. He then blamed the video game industry for being overtly violent. And then Mr. LaPierre pleaded with Congress to ensure that every school in America have armed guards because, as he famously said, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And I trust that that must have pissed off the pro-gun feminist lobby of the NRA. Mr. Lapierre often speaks compassionately about how guns are an inanimate object. You know where this is going, right? Yep. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. Which provides a lovely segue to the part of the NRA stump speech of deeply moving verbiage about the importance of mental health followed directly by a quaint little coda about why background checks are a contravention of your rights as an American citizen. Why? Because the NRA wants to make sure that every crazy person in America has the right to buy one of their clients' highly effective killing machines. Why? Because it's good for business. And because the Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, written into law in 1791, clearly protects the rights of the mentally insane to own military assault weapons. Now, we're just going to have to pause on the NRA's touching remarks and ask a kind of naive, libtard question. Just who exactly do American children need protecting from while they're learning their three R's? Reading, writing, and reloading. Most of the time, we are protecting our children from mentally ill white males who are citizens of the United States of America. Let's just say it out loud. Let's just say it like it is. The commie threat? Islamic terrorism? Nah. Our own people killing our own children. So while I am clearly trafficking in NRA subtext, I'd just like to close by saying, please join Wayne LaPierre and the NRA in demanding that Congress mandate and pay for armed guards in every school in America so our clients can continue to sell their weapons specifically designed for killing and injuring as many humans in as short a time as possible. Mummy, I'm okay, but all my friends are dead. And she was six. And the NRA says, you'll have to pry my talking points from my cold, dead hands. God bless the NRA. Hopes and prayers, y'all. See you in church on Sunday. Much has been written about the stereotype of the ugly American. He's usually imagined talking loudly, touring a foreign country, slightly obese, stuffed into a Hawaiian shirt, sporting beige baggy cargo shorts held up by a Walmart fanny pack. The sandals are from Target and the white sports socks are from the Dollar General. Who are you wearing? Oh, I'm wearing Dollar General. This caricature is imagined as being grossly insensitive to the local culture and wantonly disrespectful of the citizenry. And I mean, let's be frank here. You have done your fair share of obnoxious tourism, and you've also propped up some pretty badass juntas, because you, my friend, are one neo-colonialist bad boy. But that said, there are ugly Canadians too, but the profile is slightly different. While the ugly American tends to be either culturally oblivious or, in the case of the United Fruit Company, a conniving capitalist, the ugly Canadian is smug, slightly superior, and packing a quiet disdain for you. We do not approve of your race problems, your assault weapon epidemic, or your honey boo-boos. But don't be fooled by the ugly Canadian. We have our own pretty serious problems. December 6, 1989 was a freezing cold night in Toronto. My newborn second son was spending his first night at home. My wife and I sat on the couch surrounded by a mountain of cardboard boxes containing all of our belongings. In the morning, a truck was booked to move us six hours east to Montreal, Canada's second largest city, and the largest French-speaking city outside of Paris. We turned on the evening news, and our hearts broke. 
There was utter pandemonium outside the university building as ambulances carted away the injured. Police have now confirmed 14 students dead, all women. Another dozen people were hurt, caught in a rampage that witnesses called a human hunt, with the gunman yelling, I want women. The eyewitness accounts were horrifying. At 5.10 that day, a 25-year-old gunman went into the University École Polytechnique, separated the men from the women, and executed the women while yelling about how much he hated feminists. In 20 minutes, he shot 28 people, killing 14 women, most of whom were engineering students, before turning the weapon on himself. Following this horrific crime, gun control in Canada was tightened to the point where all guns had to be registered. But in 2012, under pressure from gun lobbyists and their base, the Conservative government of Stephen Harper reduced the powers of the gun registry by exempting unrestricted guns from registration, much to the disappointment of many Canadians, including the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. It's hard to get automatic and semi-automatic weapons in Canada, but apparently not hard enough. On January 29th, 2017, a 27-year-old Quebec City student by the name of Alexandre Bissonnette walked into a mosque outside of Quebec City with a prohibited AK-47 and two pistols, and shortly after evening prayers, shot and killed six innocent worshippers and injured 19. In the days after these tragedies, the first question we ask is, what was the profile of the shooter? Was he, and they're invariably he's, was he a citizen? What color was he? The majority of the time, the answer to that question is white. Was he from some kind of cultural background that might offer clues as to where his hatred came from? Was he crazy? Well, I don't think there's any question there. But what made him crazy? Maybe he wasn't crazy. Maybe he was just troubled. That ever-so-gentle mental health moniker lovingly accorded to our white male Christian variety of mass murderers. You know, you never could trust a white Christian male with an AK-47. So yes, we do have crime in Canada. When you immigrate, you probably won't ever say, ah, you know, it's so nice up here. But damn, I really miss the open carry of military assault weapons by my angry fellow citizens who feel it's their God-given constitutional right to kidnap elected officials. And it is really nice up here. And yet, every December 6th, we think of the promise of 14 young women who wanted to become engineers, and every January 29th, of the six peaceful men who were at prayer in their Quebec City mosque, who will pray no more. And every April 19th, we think of the 22 innocent Nova Scotians shot and killed in the largest mass murder in our history. And every June 23rd, we think of the 329 souls who perished when Canadian Sikh terrorists blew an Air India flight out of the sky. We may be prone to think we are better than you. We are not. Thank you.